All right, I'm back. Um, so now this is a, a lecture related to our, our most recent lecture was on diffusion. And so this one's gonna be on osmosis, which is kind of a special case of diffusion and is also very, very important to understanding biological processes. So let's get to work. So you recall that not all molecules can cross the cell membrane. That's why it's semi-permeable. It doesn't allow everything in. Um, now, water can cross the cell membrane pretty easily. Uh, water, of course, is very important to all kinds of chemical reactions. Um, and so water can cross the, mem the membrane with, with not too much trouble. There is a slight problem. Remember that if you've got that phospholipid bilayer, the inner part of that phospholipid bilayer are those hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids, right? Those are hydrophobic. So they do not interact well with water. Water does not interact well with them. And so the water can't cross that region, right? The, the hydrophobic region is difficult for water to cross. So you need some of these protein channels that we talked about in, in previous examples, right? There needs to be some, some holes made in the cell membrane to allow water in and out. But that's what the cell membrane is like, right? You've got a lot of these protein channels. Well, since water can cross the cell membrane, and since it's so important uh, to all kinds of, of chemical reactions and, and processes within living things, we treat the diffusion of water as a separate case. And the diffusion of water is called osmosis. So let's go back to our earlier example. And we've got a, a, a concentration of a molecule on one side of a semi-permeable membrane, right? So let's pretend this is a big molecule like urea or something. So it's a big molecule that cannot cross the membrane. And so it will diffuse and spread out, but it will only spread out on one side of the membrane. It cannot spread out to the other side of the membrane. But in real life, you're not gonna have just that one molecule. If it's a cell, you're going to have lots of water molecules. And so now in this example, these small blue circles represent those water molecules. But you remember that water molecules can cross the cell membrane. They can move across this membrane. Now what we want to do is we want to look closely at the water molecules or think closely about the water molecules in this example. On the left side of the membrane in this example that I'm showing you, they're mostly associated with urea molecules. They're sort of bound to the urea molecules. Now, back up a few lectures and think of, remember when we talked about water and its properties, and we talked about things like hydration shells. So when you dissolve something in water, the water is a polar molecule, and so it has certain ends of the water molecules will bind to the bigger molecule and sort of surround it and make a shell. Well, in this example, that's what's happening with urea. The water's interacting with the urea, forming this hydration shell, but that means it's, it's high, you know, slightly bound to it. It's, it's taken up by that bigger molecule. But on the right side, where you don't have urea, there's nothing for the water to bind to. And it's what we call free water. Water that is not associated or tied down to any other molecule. Free water can move freely. But bound water, water that's associated with other molecules, can't move as freely because it's associated with these bigger molecules. And so look again at our example. I've circled all the free water. Do you see how these waters are just water molecules and, and, and they're single and they're happy and they can do whatever they want? Whereas the other water molecules on the left side of this membrane are associated with urea. They're helping to dissolve urea. Again, why are they associated with them? Because of this polarity and, and molecular interactions and they're, they're 
lightly bound to these urea molecules, so they cannot move, <coughs> excuse me, they're tied down. They can't move as much as the free water molecules. Well, now think about concentration. Look at the concentration of free water on the left side versus the right side. You've got a much higher concentration of free water on the left side. Well, remember what we said about diffusion. Diffusion is when things move down their concentration gradient. It's when things move from high concentration to low concentration. And this works for water as, as well as for any other molecule. So if you have a high concentration of water on one side of a membrane and a low concentration of water on the other side, it will move, the water will have a net movement from high to low just due to random molecular movement. But in, this, in the osmosis example, we're talking about free water because only free water can move freely. And so it's only those free water molecules that are moving around randomly that will cross the membrane and diffuse down their concentration gradient. But that is osmosis. Water diffusing down free water, excuse me, free water diffusing down its concentration gradient. And so again, the water molecules on the right can cross the membrane because they're free. They're not bound to anything. Most of the ones on the left cannot cross the membrane because they're bound to urea. And so as those free water molecules move around randomly, they spread out evenly, you'll get a net movement of free water from right to left in this example. And that's what osmosis is. The diffusion of free water down its concentration gradient. And so, if say someone were to give you an exam and there was a question on the exam that says, what is osmosis? That's a pretty good answer. The diffusion of free water down its concentration gradient. Well, we make a big deal about this because it's just critically important to understanding many things in biology. Okay, so you may have talked about um, osmosis and diffusion before. Uh, you may be familiar with these terms, maybe not, but I want to make very clear. We have to be very precise with our language when we're talking about osmosis because it's, it's simply critical to understanding and getting things correctly. If two, two solutions have the same concentration of free water, they're isotonic. Iso meaning same. So if they have the same concentration of free water, they're isotonic. A solution that has a higher concentration of free water is called hypotonic. And a solution that has a lower concentration of free water is called hypertonic. Water will always move to the hypertonic solution, right? Um, again, you've got to figure out some way to get these terms straight in your brain. Now, hyper always means more, right? If you're hyper, that's more activity. Hyper means more. So a hypertonic solution has more of something. Well, it has more solute. So it's a salt or urea or whatever's dissolved in the water, there's more of it in the hypertonic solution. If there's more solute, that means there's less free water. And so if you've got less free water, that's a low concentration, water is going to come from the other solution. That's uh, one way to try and remember these things. But water will always diffuse to the hypertonic solution. And then this will happen until the concentration of free water is equal in both solutions until they become isotonic. <clears throat> Again, when they're isotonic, molecular movement doesn't stop, but it's equal in both directions. So there's no net movement once things become isotonic. And so in our example, the side with the urea on the left is hypertonic. The side that's just water on the right is hypotonic. 
Now you also hear terms like hyperosmotic and hypoosmotic and isoosmotic. They mean the same thing. And so in this example, water will move from the hypotonic side to the hypertonic side until they are isotonic. And you'll have a net movement of water. Okay, so let's quiz ourselves now. Which of the following will describe a soft drink? So something like Diet Coke. Is a Diet Coke hypotonic, hypertonic, isotonic, or you can't tell? Well, the answer is, you can't tell. Now, you may have thought, oh, it's hypertonic because it's got stuff dissolved into it. It doesn't work that way. Hypotonic and hypertonic are relative terms. Isotonic is also. These are relative terms. You must be comparing two things to use those terms. So if I say, is Diet Coke hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic, you have to ask me, to what? Right? So... Diet Coke is hypertonic to pure water. There is stuff in that Diet Coke, and there's nothing in pure water. So compared to, to pure water, Diet Coke is hypertonic. But compared to um, what would be something that would be extremely hypertonic, compared to seawater, the Diet Coke is hypotonic to seawater, right? Seawater is very salty. There's lots of stuff dissolved in it. And so the Diet Coke would be hypotonic to seawater. The seawater would be hypertonic to the Diet Coke. I may have misspoke a second ago, so make sure, again, listen to what I'm saying. The Diet Coke is hypotonic to the seawater. The seawater is hypertonic to the Diet Coke. The Diet Coke is hypertonic to pure water. The pure water is hypotonic to the Diet Coke. The most important, the take-home message here is these terms only make sense when you're comparing two things. Now, having said that, let me tell you the exception. Sometimes in medicine, in the medical field, we assume that you're comparing your solution to human blood or, you know, the human cells. The blood and cells all have about the same tonicity. And so... For example, um, you might want to start somebody on an isotonic saline drip, right? So you got an IV drip and you got one of those bags and on that bag it says isotonic saline. And you say, well, Dr. Spear said that only, you have to have two things to be able to call something isotonic. Well, in the medical field, a lot of times you, the patient, are the one thing, your tennis, your blood. And so an isotonic saline solution is isotonic to human blood. And that's very important, right? What would happen if you had a hypertonic saline drip? So it was hypertonic to human blood. Well, you would put this stuff in the blood. Since it's hypertonic, water will move to the saline drip. And so it will suck water out of your cells and into your blood that you know you may want that there may be some problem with your blood but you know it's important to know that right if you've got a hypotonic saline drip it's hypotonic to human blood it's got more water than hum than, than the blood or more water than the cells and so then the water will move out of the saline drip into the cells isotonic you don't have to worry about it it's not going to interfere at all um my you know contact lens solution it says on the bottle, it's isotonic, right? You, you want it to match the tonicity of your eyes. You don't want it to suck water out of your eyes or push water into your eyes. So, that is a situation where, you know, it's sort of assumed what you're comparing it to. But we're not going to do that in my class. This is not a medical class. This is a zoology class. So, in my class, this semester, you could only use these terms if you know what you're comparing. All right? All right. Okay. Well, this becomes very relevant when we're talking about cells because your cells have a lot of stuff in them, right? It's an aqueous environment. The cytoplasm, of course, has a, a tremendous amount of water, but it also has a tremendous amount of other things, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, inorganic molecules, right? Sodium, potassium, iron, calcium, 
all of that and water is inside your cell. So there's a lot of junk inside your cells. And so we're really concerned about um, you know, the tonicity of your cells and how that cell is going to be affected depending upon its surrounding environment. So are your cells isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic to pure water? Well, this you can tell. I've got two things to compare. I've got my cell and I've got pure water. And the cells have more stuff dissolved in them than the water. So they are hypertonic. There's less free water in your cell relative to pure water. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen if you put one of your cells in pure water? It'll shrink, it'll swell, or you cannot tell. Well, if your cell is hypertonic to pure water and you put it in a beaker of pure water, that water is going to diffuse into the cell. Water always goes to the hypertonic thing. So if you've got water diffusing into your cell, what's gonna to happen to your cell? It's gonna swell up and burst. Or it's at least gonna swell up. It may burst. Okay, so here's a figure from your book kind of illustrating this idea, right? Um, it's important to understand the tonicity of the environment that surrounds the cell. So in the top example, we're dropping red blood cells into a hypotonic solution. So that means the red blood cell is hypertonic. It has more stuff in it. And so water is going to diffuse into the cell. There's more free water outside the cell. And that's what they're kind of showing you on the right side of this. And so since that water is going to diffuse into the cell, the cell is going to swell up and it might burst or lies. In the middle example, the red blood cells are in an isotonic solution. So there's just as much stuff as, you know, outside the cell as inside the cell. The concentration is the same. So the concentration of free water is the same inside as outside the cell. Is water not moving? No, water's moving in and out of the cell, but in an equal amount. And so the cell neither swells nor shrinks. You've got a dynamic equilibrium. In the bottom example, the red blood cells are in a hypertonic solution. So there's more stuff outside the cell. Inside the cell, there's more free water. So that free water is going to diffuse out of the cell and the cell is going to shrink or crenate. And so again, you know, if in, the, in the medical veterinary field, this is critical that you understand these terms um, because you could really do some damage if you put, you know, the wrong tonicity stuff in your patient's blood. Okay, another question, who pees more? <laughs> There's a curveball. A freshwater fish or a saltwater fish? Again, I'm a fish guy, so all my examples have to do with fish. Fish are a really good example in, for this concept though. So does a freshwater fish pee more? A saltwater fish pee more? They both pee equally or fish don't pee? Well, the answer is a freshwater fish pees more. So a freshwater fish lives in fresh water. The inside of the fish is saltier. It has more stuff than the outside because it's freshwater fish. So consequently, where's the water gonna go? The water's going to go into the fish. Freshwater fish are constantly absorbing water because of osmosis. They have less free water inside their cells. Well, they gotta get rid of that excess water. You saw on the previous slide, if you, if you don't do anything, um, those cells can swell up and swell up and swell up and they can burst. So you've got to constantly be getting rid of that extra water. And so a freshwater fish is always peeing. Maybe you've noticed this. If you ever caught a fish, you know, around here, sometimes when you pick up the fish and you're trying to take them off the hook, they pee everywhere. That's because they're always peeing. So think about that next time you're swimming in Kentucky Lake. All the fish peeing around you. Now saltwater fish is going to be exactly the opposite. A saltwater fish lives in salty water. 
the outside of the fish is saltier. There's more stuff dissolved outside the fish. There's more free water inside the fish's cells. So it's constantly losing water to its environment. So the saltwater fish has to drink constantly. Another saltwater question. What are you supposed to do when a jellyfish stings you? Now there are freshwater jellyfish. We have them here in Kentucky, they're invasive. But most of the time you find jellyfish in salt water. What should you do if a jellyfish stings you? Pee on it, suck the poison out, put toothpaste on it, or soak the wound in salt water? Well, I'm betting many of you answered pee on it because that's what everybody says, right? And I think that this is probably an idea that comes from this idea of osmosis, that somehow peeing on it through osmosis is going to make it better. But the problem is it doesn't work. Well, honestly, nothing works and everything works. And so this is just like cures for the common cold, all right? Nothing works and everything works. And why is that? Because if you wait long enough, the cold will cure itself and you'll get better. And it's the same thing with a jellyfish sting. If you wait long enough, the sting will just get better, right? And so that's why we have all these different ideas for how to cure a cold or what to do when a jellyfish stings you because everybody tries them and they all work because eventually it just goes away. Well, that's not how you test remedies. Um, you know, and, and you have to, to do uh, better science to try to find out if the treatment really is solving the problem. So none of these things really work to cure a jellyfish sting. Well, why am I even bringing this up? Because jellyfish stings are a good example. Excuse me, did I jump one? No, I didn't. Jellyfish stings are a good example of osmosis. Um, the jellyfish um, are cnidarians, and this is a phylum that we're gonna talk about in lab. And they have specialized organelles called nematocysts. And the nematocysts um, are within these, these cells, the cells are called nidocytes. I guess the nematocysts um, are specialized organelles within the nidocytes. And they have a stinging thread. And so when you bump up against a jellyfish or one of its relatives, it shoots those stinging threads into you and they have a mild venom. And that's what burns and, and hurts really bad. And so here's a picture and you can see, um, this is a hydra, which is also another um, cnidarian. And so we look at the tentacles and you zoom in and you can see the, these nidocyte cells that are embedded on the surface of the, the hydra's um, tentacles. And then within that cell, you've got this nematocyst and you can see how it's arranged. It's sort of like an inverted balloon or something. And then there's this thread wrapped around it that's got a a barb on it that's got a little bit of poisonous venom. It's very small, but there's a lot of these. And so then when this is, is triggered, that th thread shoots out and embeds in whatever is nearby and releases that venom. And so this is to protect themselves, but also for things like Hydra, this is how they capture their food. So how does this work and how does this relate to osmosis? The nematocyst contains a very, very, very high concentration of calcium ions, right? So the organism used energy to pump tons of calcium. So it's an incredibly high concentration of calcium ions. That makes it very, very hypertonic to its surrounding environment, which means water really, really, really wants to rush in, but it can't. The water can't rush in because there's a cap that seals off this nematocyst. And so behind that cap is a bunch of calcium and, and the water, if it could get in, it would rush in because of the, the osmotic pressure. Well, you've got this little trigger that's attached to the cap. And so if something brushes against this nematocyst, that trigger will pop the cap open now seawater can rush in. Water can rush in 
and will rush in because of the high osmotic pressure. Well, it's just like the earlier example. If you put a blood cell uh, in, into the wrong environment, all that water rushing in causes the cell to swell. But in this example, it swells very much and very rapidly because there's so much calcium. And so it's like blowing up a balloon. <laughs> and it blows up balloons, or maybe it's like the, uh, the airbags in a car. It very rapidly expands, but when it does that, that shoots that thread out. And when it sh that's how it's able to shoot that thread out, and that thread's got venom on you. So, that's an example of how understanding osmosis helps you understand how something works in the natural world. You've got, you know, these, these jellyfish in that that don't have teeth or, and they're not very fast. They can't, they got to protect themselves somehow and they got to capture prey somehow while well, they've got these nematocysts. And so if anything gets close enough to brush against it, that will pop open those caps, water rushes in, the airbag expands, shoots the threads out. And if it was one or two, no big deal. But if you've got thousands of these, it becomes a big deal. And so that nidocyte turns inside out because of the, the swelling up of water and it shoots the thread out and the venom on the end of that thread is what causes the discomfort. And so here's a figure from your book, um, again, showing you this sort of a diagram of this and giving you an idea of, of how this is, uh, you know, this thread is coiled up inside the nidocyte and then when, when the water rushes in, it, it's able to swell up and shoot out. Now, there are some things that might work. Vinegar might work. Baking soda might work. There's a little bit of testing that's been done, um, but that's not got anything to do with osmosis as much as pH, right? So maybe it's neutralizing the venom. But when I looked into this, really there's not very good evidence for anything that really helps. Usually it just goes away on its own. So that's why everything seems to work. So let's look at some pictures. I just found some cool pictures of people that got jellyfish stings. So you can see where the tentacle draped across this person's leg and all the, the threads shot in. And of course you're you know, probably getting an allergic reaction to the venom, which is why this looks so horrible. Oh, it looks awful. Look at that, scarring from it. Anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. That's a pretty cool explanation for how this works. So that's osmosis. Let me know if you got any questions. See ya.